This series is about understanding the reasons why people cheat and how to prevent it. It's not about condemning the act of cheating. It's about understanding it. This is because not all cheating is the same. Yes, some cheat because they're selfish and have absolutely no moral compass whatsoever, <laughs> while others cheat because their moral compass is telling them to stay in a relationship for altruistic reasons. For example, the emotional or financial welfare of children or elderly parents. Yet doing so often means enduring years or even decades of silent suffering. So I'm not taking sides on this issue. I am not saying what a cheater is doing is right or wrong because each situation is different and I don't have to walk in their shoes or their partners. I am simply presenting a series on understanding as sensitive as the subject is for many. Thanks for joining me. So why do people cheat? Well, the answer in a nutshell is unmet emotional needs. Of course, it's not that simple, but I mean, for those of you who want to get the information and go, there it is. That's the answer. Unmet emotional needs. There could be, you know, a misalignment of values, outright selfishness, Perhaps illness or some kind of physical separation has brought this about, but let's go a little bit deeper into those possible scenarios, all three of which demonstrate somebody having emotional needs that are not met. First off, with the misalignment of values, we've got to acknowledge that sex is not that important to some people. It is to others. And the same with love and intimacy. Not to say that that's not important to people, but for some people, intimacy is more difficult for them than others. And for those of you who are familiar with astrology or you know the work I've done with astrology, I've talked about this. You know, there are astrological placements that <clears throat> are in people's natal charts, you know, at their time of birth that indicate that perhaps sex is repressed, their sexuality is repressed, or um, their love nature is in some way repressed. And just as a side note, for those of you who are interested in that, you know, repressed sexuality would be like a Mars in the 12th house, or repressed intimacy, suppressed intimacy would be like Venus in the 12th house. So um, I talk more about this in my ideal life partner video here on YouTube, and I'll probably put the video at the end if you want to watch that. And I also do, you know, readings. So I'm sharing that with you not to sell people on my services, although yes, more than open to helping you if you were interested with that. But the point of me bringing it up is to say that it is really good to get to know a prospective partner on this level before you really get involved. Know what you're getting yourself committed to, okay? Because sexual incompatibility and having an incompatible love nature with somebody, which can be seen in the Mars and Venus placements, by the way, that is something you want to know about up front. Because I have learned the hard way. This is one of my life lessons is never value your fidelity to someone with whom you're sexually incompatible. Because no amount of effort will help you to overcome it. This person is who they are, and you are who you are, energetically. And astrology aside, it's just flat a red flag if you have to hide, suppress, or deny your needs in order to be in this relationship, whether it's your sexual needs or your need for intimacy and, you know, your love nature and all of that. A healthy relationship uh, should complement who you authentically are, not censor it. And a healthy relationship will help you be the best you that you can be, not mold you into someone else to suit someone else's needs. There's a saying that it has stuck with me for many years now, and it is that love leaves you better than it found you. And another thing I've learned is that love is willing to release you if that's what is in your best interest, because love is about taking another person's best interest as your own. So going back to the values, you've got to look at their needs versus yours and understand your temperament versus theirs. Now, 
I have to say also, I've done a lot of work on here talking about narcissism, and I've got a book on narcissism. What can get tricky is if you're dealing with a narcissist, uh, this is someone who can fake shared values. They can pretend like the two of you are totally compatible. <laughs> and in reality, you're not. And so that's, again, another video for another day. But I definitely want to make you aware of the need to really assess this individual's authentic personality. And a lot of times you're not going to get that until like six months into the relationship. You know, some people, they get bored easily. Um, I see this a lot with people who are the sign of Aries, right? Not all of them, but people who have a lot of Aries energy in their natal charts, uh, they can get very bored easily. They need a partner that's going to keep things fresh and exciting. And if you are partnered with someone like that, are you able to do that? Are you able to keep it fresh and exciting? Or if your Aries have this energy where things, you know, you need to feel like things are not getting dull or boring or predictable or monotonous, are you partnering with someone who's able to keep up with you at that level and that pace? It's really important to look at personalities and temperaments because if they can't keep up with you or you can't keep up with them at their level and their needs, such as predictability in the bedroom, right? And somebody can't stand that. Whereas what one person considers predictable, the other person considers stable and secure over time that's going to wear on the relationship because to one person the stability and security is more important than sex and intimacy whereas you might be partnered with someone who has a totally opposite value system and again if you're inclined towards sacrificing sex and intimacy for stability and security then you might be the kind of person who's willing to go to the extreme of living in an emotional prison under sexual lockdown to have that if it's that important to you and i have to say that many women cannot fully relax and open up sexually if they do not feel secure in a relationship or if her sense of security has been repeatedly violated because of his lies and instability then she can no longer emotionally connect with him in the bedroom and if she can't emotionally connect with him she likely can't physically connect with him either and it's really a deal killer for many women i i think that the need for sex to be physical emotional and spiritual is huge for women and men often don't understand how emotional betrayals negatively impact sex with women because for many men, sex is merely physical. But if you're a man and you're not connecting with a woman emotionally and spiritually during sex, you're really leaving her in a deficit that will surely degrade your physical connection over time. Let me give you an example. Someone I knew uh, had been in a marriage of 20 years to a man who repeatedly lied and was financially unstable. To make matters worse, he would not emotionally connect with his wife during sex. And no matter what she tried, he would never participate in an authentic relationship in or outside of the bedroom. For him, it was easier to just keep up appearances and false fronts to avoid emotional intimacy or to just turn to porn, you know, to avoid emotional and physical intimacy altogether. After years of being left emotionally and sexually neglected because of his refusal to address his intimacy problems and growing porn addiction, he was unable to sexually perform with a real person. They began sleeping in separate beds, in separate rooms. This was done to avoid the costly consequences of divorce to their finances and their family. Yet the cost to her emotional and physical health was nearly as bad as that, if not worse. See, it's not just about the emotional connection. It's about what that connection means to them. For her, uh, not having an emotionally and financially secure relationship triggered all kinds of soul wounds of not being valued and not feeling worthy. She often wondered, why wasn't I good enough? Concerns about deservingness were always brought up. In reality, the issue was his alone that he refused to repair, despite her willingness to help. Basically, it wasn't her fault, but it was a problem. And he was content to keep it that way. 
This triggered her own past trauma of childhood emotional neglect. Worse, she had a deep need for meaningful sex. Beyond the mechanics of being a good lover, she wanted to feel emotional connection and release. Despite repeatedly expressing that to him, her sexual frustrations only increased. He explained, I don't know how to be that person to you. It makes me very uncomfortable. And since she was left with no healthy outlet, no other person with whom she could release stress and recharge her own energy, she began turning to food for comfort, gaining weight, and seeking solace in emotional affairs with other men, even if it was simply in her own fantasies and imagination. To watch the next video in this series where we discuss the other two unmet emotional needs, click here. And to watch the video on how to know your ideal life partner, click here. As always, thanks for watching, liking, sharing, and subscribing.